As promised, we are now going to run a Hadoop job. So at a high level, running a job has three steps. Actually four, if you include the setup that we did in the previous section. So the first step here is we're going to upload our Hadoop job jar and whatever data we want to process to S3. Then we tell Amazon what we want to do with our job, which basically means what kind of job we're running, what data we're processing, for input, where we want the results to go, what kind of logging we want, etc. And finally, we run the job. We wait for it to finish, we can monitor it, and we can look at the results. So the first step is setting up that S3 bucket. We created the bucket in the previous section, but now we need to set up the four different subdirectories that contain the elements of a job. So one of those elements is the Hadoop job jar. In this example that I'm going to be doing, We've got a bucket called AWS test KK. In there is a job directory, and in that job directory we put the job jar. Then we've got our input data. We're going to upload some data that our job is going to process. We have the directory where we want to put our results, and we have the directory where, we want, where we're going to tell Amazon that we want it to put the log files from the job. And again, we can use the AWS console to create all these directories inside the bucket and to handle uploading files. So let's go do that. All right, we're going to walk through the steps required to get the data up into S3 that we need to be able to run our job. So once again, we start at the top level of the AWS console. We're going to click on S3 because we're going to be pushing data up into an S3 bucket that we'd previously created. So over here, we've got this AWS test KK bucket. Now, one of the first things I typically do here is I create some folders. So inside this bucket, I have a folder that I'm going to call job. And this is where I'm going to put the job jar. I'm going to create another folder. And this one I'm going to call logs. And this is where I'm going to tell uh, EMR to put the job log files at the end of the job. I'm also going to create a folder here called data, where I'm going to upload my input data. And I'm going to create another folder here called results, which is what I'm going to use for the results of the job. So I've got these folders created. So now. I'm going to drill into the job directory, which is empty, and now I'm going to upload a job jar. So let us go find a job jar to upload. Here it is, and you can see it's 7.8 megabytes, so uh, it's going to take a little while. We can watch it over here. Oh, it's going pretty fast. All right. so. While that is uploading, I can actually start other uploads, but in this case, it's going to finish fast enough. OK, so now let's go back to here and let us open up the data directory. And now I'd like to upload some input data. So here I've got some Wikipedia data that I previously prepared, a small sample of it. And this shouldn't take very long because it's pretty small. All right, so at this point, I've got both the job jar uploaded and the input data uploaded. Now, the second step is to do what Elastic MapReduce calls creating the job flow. Now, this job flow has a whole bunch of settings. Uh, specifically, you have to give it a name. You have to tell it what kind of job it is. You need to specify the cluster, what type of servers, how many. You need to tell it what key pair to use to run the job, where to put the log files, a few other things that you typically don't need to care about. Uh, so we're going to go and we're going to set up a job flow. And now I can go and actually create the job flow using the EMR interface. So I'm going to click on Elastic MapReduce here. It's going to show me that I don't have any job flows. So I'm going to create a new job flow. And I'll call this. Wikipedia processing. And I'm going to run my own application versus there are some samples that have been pre-created. And the job type here that I'm running is going to be a custom jar. Now it's going to ask me where this jar is located. And here I need to put in the path starting with the bucket in S3 where the job is the job jar is located. So I know I put this into AWS test kk slash job slash and it's called the Wikipedia ngrams dash job dot jar. 
Now I have to specify the arguments, and these are the arguments that are actually going to the main method of the class that's been specified in my job jars manifest. So here I know I need to specify the input file that I'm going to be processing. And note that here I'm using real HDFS paths, so I'm specifying S3n as the protocol because input file is going to be coming from S3. And of course it's coming out of the AWS test KK bucket at the location of the data subdir and en wiki split.xml. I also have to tell my program where the output's going, so I'm going to say minus output dir. In this case, again, it needs to go into S3 because otherwise it's just going to disappear when the cluster terminates. So I'm going to again put it into that same AWS test KK bucket in the results directory and I also can specify an additional parameter in my program that says I only want to use one reduced task so I'll wind up with a single output file. So I click the continue button and now it's letting me pick the type and the number of the servers that are going into my cluster. So for my master I'm going to use an m1 small instance here. For my slaves I'm going to use two m1 small instances and I'm not going to use any task only instances. We'll talk about that in the last module of the course where you can use a tax, task instance group and request spot pricing for it. Uh, and there's good reasons for doing that, but we're, we don't need to do that for this particular example. And for keys, I'm using that AWS test key that I previously created for the key pair. I don't need to have a virtual private cloud. Um, for the logs that are being generated by the job. I want them to go into that AWS test KK bucket in the logs, logs subdirectory. I'm not doing any special debugging logging. If I did want to do this, I'd have to use simple DB. We'll talk about that later. And uh, I don't need to keep my cluster around once the job finishes, so keep alive is set to no. When I click continue, it lets me um, decide whether I want to use anything, any bootstrap actions, and we'll talk about that again in the last module. This is a way to sort of alter the configuration of my cluster or do special setup of servers in my cluster. But I don't need any of that. So I click continue. It gives me one last chance to check over all the settings, and then I can create the job flow. Once the job flow has been created, I can go back over here and it'll show me that I've got this job that's starting up. And at some point, Typically a couple of minutes, my cluster will be running, which means uh, Elastic MapReduce has allocated the servers that I asked for, uh, provisioned them with Hadoop, downloaded my job jar, and started up the job. And so we're going to wait until that happens, then we're going to take a look at the job as it's running. While your job is running, you can use the AWS console to monitor it, to find out what state it's in. Is it starting up? Is it actually running the job? Is it terminating, is it done? You can also see how long it's been running and you get an estimate of roughly how much it's going to cost you. And if need be, you can terminate the job. So we've started our job. Let's go take a look at it. Okay, now you see we're actually running the job. So the status has changed to running. And here it shows that you have this normalized instance hours. What that's saying is that as soon as this cluster starts actually running, I'm being charged for three servers times up to an hour. And if I actually had a job that ran longer than an hour, then you'd see this jumping up to six instance hours. This is one of the reasons why you want to avoid having a job that fails right away, because you're still going to pay for the number of servers times at least one hour, even if your job only runs for 10 seconds. Now, the actual runtime for this job isn't very long, so I expect pretty quickly this job will succeed. If I go down here and look at the steps, what you'll see here is I've got essentially one step in my flow, which is this single jar uh, job that's running with my parameters that I passed it down here. Once the job finishes, the status will change to shutting down. And at that point, the results of the run are being copied up to S3, which includes both the results and also the um, log files. So you can see the status just changed to shutting down. My lapse time, and the lapse time actually doesn't start 
until the cluster is actually up and running the job. So the total lapse time for this job was only four minutes. Now that the job is finished, I can actually go take a look at the results. When I set up my job, I specified my output directory, and that was actually a parameter to the job that I was running. So I told it where in S3 to put it using the S3N protocol. Now because the Hadoop cluster goes away at the end of the job, it means all the drives that are used for HDFS, they're ephemeral, which means they disappear. So the only way to persist data typically is that you have to write it to S3. Now you can set up job flows where they are alive. That means they don't terminate at the end of your job. And that's a great way to debug jobs when you're first getting started with them. And we'll talk about uh, that more later. But a typical run has everything going into S3, which means you get both the results and typically that's because your program is using some output path that you specify and you tell it that you want to write it into S3. And secondly, Elastic MapReduce is going to copy all of the log files up to the location you specified in S3. And in our case, we used the bucket name aws-test-skk slash logs. So let's go look at the job results. Now if I go over to S3, and I take a look in my AWS test KK bucket. You see I've got my four directories there. If I look in the results directory, my job has created two subdirectories inside there, raw counts and sorted counts. Sorted counts I know is the final output. And here you see the typical Hadoop success file, and then also a part file from the reducer, so part dash r dash five zeros. And I can actually download this file, and I'll open it up with bbedit, my editor of choice. And that displays results that look like this. Now what this job does is it generates bigram counts from text found in Wikipedia stories. So you can see that the most common bigram was E space and it occurred 4,025 times in that snippet from Wikipedia that I uploaded into the S3 uh, data directory, subdirectory of my bucket. Now if we go back up to the bucket level and I look in logs, what you'll see here is it's created a J dash and then a job ID directory. So this has information about the actual job. If I open up this one, you'll see there's a bunch of subdirectories. Most of this isn't that interesting. It's information being logged by the Hadoop system itself. But if you look in steps, I only had one step. So it's just a single subdirectory called one. If I look inside of that, you'll see I've got a number of files in here. The interesting one is standard out. This is where my logging goes. So if I double click at this, because it's a regular text file, uh, I'll just get a window popped up with the results, with the contents of this. And this is what my job was logging. It was giving me information about the job tracker, and I printed out some information about input and output paths, and the n-gram size I was using, etc. So as you can see, Elastic MapReduce automatically uploaded this information into the directory that I'd specified as my logs directory when I was defining my job. And if in particular, my job failed, then this is where I'd start looking for clues as to what went wrong. And remember that there's a, a lag between when the job finishes and this data gets uploaded, especially if your job's doing a lot of logging, then you can have potentially many, many gigabytes of log files, and those will take some time to upload. So if you have a large cluster generating lots of logging output, I typically wait at least five minutes, more like 10 minutes after my job has finished before I start looking for the logs from the job. All right, to summarize, Running jobs using Elastic MapReduce is very simple. You define the jobs using the AWS console. Your input data and your job jar gets loaded from S3. The results of your job, which include the log files, get pushed back up to S3. And you can use the AWS console to monitor the status of your job. Now in the next module, we're going to go and look at the different options you have for servers that you can use to create your Hadoop cluster.